is this Sandra Sheffrey, president of Democratic Women's Club of Greater Broward. Guess what day it is? It's the day after the election, y'all, and we still don't know who the president is. <laughs> How about that? We still don't know who the president is. And I'm going to tell y'all to vote like a black woman, because if y'all did, y'all would know who the president is right now. Exactly. Okay? All right. So again, Sandra Sheffrey, president of Democratic Women's Club of Greater Broward. This is our Wednesday night segment of Race and the Races. And we got a lot to talk about, y'all, because a whole bunch of madness happened. A whole bunch of madness happened. Miami-Dade County lost like two of their U.S. House of Representatives seat members. The Florida's, um, Florida um, House and uh, State Senate lost a whole bunch of members. People, they didn't keep seats. They didn't win any new seats. People who we thought were like good turned out to be no good. We got to figure out what that's all about and we got to figure out what the democratic party is going to do moving forward for 2022 so i got some folks here with me that's going to talk about this we got steven meza he was a former candidate for the florida state senate we got um Narnie grant she was a former candidate for a brown county school board and we got our um criminal justice phd candidate extraordinaire carolyn wheeler here talking to us today right so I don't know who want to start it off, right? Because I'm still trying. I'm still in my feelings. I'm, I got like some stuff going on because I need to hear about this 270 so I could settle down and move on with my life. So one of y'all just decide to talk because uh, I don't know. I don't you know. I'm still in your feelings, but we're going to let Mr. Stephen Mezzer talk. You know why we're going to let Mr. Stephen Mezzer talk first? Because he came on his Facebook page and, made, and spit some facts that needed to be heard today. And uh, I concur 100%, so does Sandra. And uh, Steve, tell us, you break that down, honey. Break it down oh, a little bit. Oh, no. but I do need to, I need to, I need to say something else because we got to be true to the flyer. So we actually going to have Andrew Forbes, right? Community officers, coach, Christian man, father, Navy um, officer. He's coming on at six o'clock. He's doing his daddy duties right now, but he's coming on at six o'clock and he's going to explain to us like, what's up with these brothers, right? Because they're going to get some blame for what happened. I don't know if they should or they shouldn't, but they about to get some blame and he about to talk to us about this and uh, hopefully uh, have me feeling better in a minute because I'm telling you y'all, I ain't right. I ain't okay yet. I'll be okay when they confirm that 270 for Joe Biden. Uh, All right, Stephen. I'll let you heard me. All right, so yes, we're going to have Mr. Forbes on shortly, but in the meantime, in between time, we're going to have Mr. Stephen Meza. And Mr. Stephen Meza, can you please tell the people uh, what you posted today and why? Um, so today I, I posted a little analysis basically of what went wrong within the Democratic Party, especially the Florida Democratic Party. One of the biggest issues really at this moment is the fact that there was a lack of leadership. It was an inept form of leadership. There was a lack of strategy. There was a lack of actual care to what was actually going on in this election cycle, because as we all know, it's the election of our lifetime. It's the election of my generation and future generations. And the biggest problem besides just the inept leadership is the fact that, again, we had no strategy. Um, it seems as if the Florida Democratic Party was hoping and was riding the premise on the fact that everybody has a, a discourse of feelings against uh, Donald Trump's rhetoric on top of racism, xenophobia, his, um, his response to the actual uh, coronavirus situation. And overall, I, I mean, I, I think we dropped the ball 100%. And, and there's, a, there's something that needs to happen and it's, uh, it's a reckoning. It's, it's actually a philosophical, abstract perception of what we need to do as a party to move forward overall. And what that really means is, what do we need to do to win moving forward? What do we need to do to secure down ballot candidates from the local, state, and federal level? We lost literally races in South Florida that were not expected. We lost seats within the Florida House that were not expected. Um, we are, if anything, an, again, a, a minority. We are nowhere near close to becoming the majority party in the state of Florida. And that is honestly a concern on every level for the fact that we can't get anything done. <laughs> we are back to being stuck in a rut. We have to blame party leadership. We have to blame Terry Rizzo. We have to go ahead and hold Bobby DeBose accountable. We need to hold our next incoming Senate president leader Perry Thurston accountable for the simple fact that honestly, guys, nobody is willing to speak up and speak out to what these progressive values or this tent that the Democratic Party has established. Because honestly, the problem here is 
nobody cared enough to reach out to the small candidates. Nobody cared to reach out to the down ballot candidates. Nobody cared enough to put in the effort. Terry Rizzo, a great example of her is her posting every day a picture of her driving through the state of Florida to go ahead and talk about some, I'm here to support a candidate. That is not how you support a candidate. You give a candidate a platform. The same thing with the House Victory Fund. You give candidates, not financial means if you can, but the fact that you give them a platform. And it's the same thing with the Senate Victory Fund. Nobody got a platform. I mean, JJR is a good example of this. He is one of the, I mean, the strongest progressive legislatures in the Florida House. And the fact that nobody allowed him the real necessary equipment to win the race, such as volunteers, phone bankers, people, genuine people on the ground, a grassroots campaign to push the narrative of saving our soul, I think it's been a letdown overall. And I, and I want to hold these people accountable, not because these are the people that we think are the Democratic Party, but because they are the representation and the leadership at the very top of the party. And it, and it matters because if we don't hold them accountable, nothing will change. The biggest concern for me at this moment is what's going to happen in 2022. What I can see is, is a flawed philosophy of strategy. We need to rethink what we're doing as a party. I understand Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high, but we're in Florida and we cannot go ahead and stoop to this level. We have to show aggression, force, and offense. We are at war for our democracy to sustain the capability of what the American dream is. And the right. fact that we will never be able to actually push those progressive ideas or even just the democratic ideals, it's going to be a disservice to everybody within the community of South Florida, Northern Florida, Central Florida, the entire state. And it goes ahead and it resonates within the national party because again, we are the minority in the Senate. And I mean, I love the fact that we have retained the house but the fact that we're losing pieces of the house shows yeah. that we need to a, another and a stronger strategy to maintain that majority. We're never going to get anything we need until we maintain it. And I personally believe that it's not only a philosophical view, it's a fundamental view that Democrats try to keep this polished view. And I completely respect it in all regards. But we need to also realize that we're working against people who are coming at us for our necks, who are sweeping the floor with us and have no regard for morality. Politics has never been about morality. It's been about literally campaigning in poetry and governing in prose. And if we cannot hold to that standard, we can never go ahead and truly make the change that we're looking for. And I know at the bottom of everybody's heart throughout the United States and through the state of Florida, we are feeling it today, and we are all saddened by the losses that we've had from Debbie McCarcel Power to Donna Shalala to even all the House races that we have contested. We made a good plan, but it wasn't the plan of the party. It was the plan of outside forces who were willing to change the demographic of who we are and what we believe in. And that is what we need to focus on moving forward. What we need to do in 2022, again, is strategy and nothing will change until we and you and you said a lot right and you you called out some folks um I've, you know we have multiple point of views on this panel right because some of the people you're talking about i know and i and i know they have great intentions you understand what i'm saying and sometimes you know that kind of just doesn't manifest manifest itself into what it is that you're the, um the, what you're trying to get so um so we we got to do that we um we, we we have to basically call it what it is right i mean it, it was definitely a failure there's a whole bunch of different reasons why these things happen um and one of the points you made about you know michelle said we gotta go when they go low we go high but at the same time you gotta fight the fight you're in right like you have to fight the, you'll be like well i want to fight you no 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 you gotta fight the battle that you're in right and that doesn't necessarily mean that you gotta go low down and dirty but you can't be out here being nice to people like you said that are going for your neck so we definitely have to come up with like a different plan on how to move 
forward, right? We definitely have to find out, um, figure out a different plan on how to move forward. And we and we got to stop the bleeding because if this happens in 2022, it's, it's going to be a wrap. We're going we gonna to have our Democratic president and then we're going to have like a Republican Senate and a Republican House and we're going to have like Obama 2010, 12 and uh, 14 moving forward. And that's that's not going to really get um, the, uh, the agenda of what it is that the, the people really want. And what I think happened, right, is that there's clearly a disconnect between you know the leaders of the Democratic Party and the new versions of the more progressive Democrats, right? It's like they're afraid of it. But you know what? You can't be scared of this. You're gonna have to embrace this because this is really what's happening, right? I'm not really, I'm not young. I'm like, I'm 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 as old as like uh you know Nancy Pelosi and them, but I'm definitely not your age, Mr. Mezzo. So I'm somewhere in the middle, but I understand the need for the progressive ideas and and I can see what you know the old heads are doing, and they're just not um um, they're not coming together. And they've made some serious costly mistakes, some serious costly mistakes. For instance, the woman that they had running against Mitch McConnell, if anybody should have lost their job yesterday, he's one of the people that should have lost his job because a lot of what what's happening and what happened um, in the last two years is because of him. That Supreme Court justice getting, you know, um, confirmed in one month is him. Those 200 conservative judges that they have on the federal bench, that's because of him. You know, that was not um, Donald Trump's plan. That's Mitch McConnell. So if anybody should have lost their job yesterday, it should have been him. But they put a candidate because there was a progressive brother that was part of that Democratic primary that they just thought was too progressive. They were scared of him. And they put this chick on. Well, oh, I shouldn't call her a chick. They put a woman forward who's well decorated, right? I shouldn't refer to a chick. That's, the, you know, I. I'm decorated nonetheless. It's how she, you talk. It's how you she, talk. Can't, she, she did not have what it took to fight against or run against a Mitch McConnell in conservative crazy crazy Kentucky, right? So, you know, they, and they spent 88, they gave that woman like $88 million to run against this man. And Nikki sent me this video, you know, gave me those numbers earlier today. They spent $88 million for them to lose. They got like, she only won like a third, you know, like 30 something percent. You spent $88 million and that's all you get. You don't even get a, cl a close race. You know what that means? That meant that you put up the wrong candidate, right? And they also made a mistake with um, Jamie Harrison. He was the one running against Lizzie Graham. That's another one of them dudes that should have lost their job dollars. yesterday, right? $100 he spent a hundred million dollars, and you know what? He didn't get a hundred. He didn't spend a hundred million dollars because they gave him a hundred million dollars. He was the leader of the Democratic Party in South Carolina, so he knew how to get money, right? He knew how to play that money game, so he was able to spend a, get a hundred million dollars, and he spent it to get what thirty something percent of the votes. Listen, that money could have gone to a whole bunch of other candidates that would have like that would have um the progressive candidates that would have done a better job against running, you know, and at the very least, they should like um Steven said, they should have given these people a platform, send out some emails for them, put them on the show, get them a little bit of exposure, because they're gonna do the grinding local. They just needed some more like recognition so people to know them. So the Democratic Party, listen, y'all, y'all messed up yesterday, and y'all better figure that out. And you guys gonna have to, y'all gonna have to get on board, get on board with this progressive train because what y'all doing, it ain't worth, it ain't worth. And, and there's no way Biden should be fighting for his life right now. Just no way. So the vetting process, I is just, a but I mean they don't. I just do, wanna don't have a good vetting process. Period. They, I just you know, wanna they, add they really quickly they too want. because they just not picking what we need. All right, go ahead. I just wanna add really quickly because Sandra, you made a good point. It's the fact that I will give Republicans this. They stand firm to their values, whether it be hypocritical, whether it be undermining, whether it be fascist or, I mean, downright dogmatic. What true. I think needs to happen within the Democratic Party, we need to own that we created a large tent. Mm -hmm. We are not giving third parties any room to take any bit of our base. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, we need to do, and I, and I personally, I'm going to say this, I did vote for Bernie and I'm only voting for Biden and I did vote for Biden for strategy because I want Trump out. But other than that, Bernie, the reason why him and AOC and Trump have been successful and why the Republican Party is successful is because they're willing to own up and actually stand firm in the values they believe in. Mm -hmm. People want authentic, genuine takes on what policy is. And if you're not going to do that, I don't see why you're a politician because I mean, even Trump, I don't personally agree with anything, but a lot of the Republicans I speak to, his rhetoric is not a concern. 
the concern is his policy and he stands firm. He's not going to switch. He's not going to. Because he reminds you constantly that he's all about his paper, right? He'll talk about all that stuff. He's like, listen, the stock market is doing fine. He basically telling you like that's long as that's happening, that's what I'm here. That's what I'm here to do. And he's going to keep doing it no matter the cost. Right. He he he, he's acting like it ain't two hundred and thirty three thousand dead people because of coronavirus right he's acting like that's not that, happening he actually he's declared that's, that's, he's actually de- that's water that under the ground for him huh he declared that he solved the problem he, he, he he's trying to right stand in the corner that is fantasy but that's what he's saying right and he he's not acknowledging that there's people that they've been working for like eight months and they still don't know how they're gonna pay their bills and they don't know when they're gonna get a job he's just like no but the stock market is up didn't you see it went up like 200 points yesterday because whatever that's what he's about and he's gonna con- continue to remind you that's what it's about and he's like yeah i'm that dude that trash talk everybody that don't support me and he continues to do that even though it's inconsistent, he allow one minute. You got video proof that he lied. He be like, "I said that." You know what I mean? Like, dude, don't care. Okay, you can't play nice with this cat, right? No, but he's consistent to his party, right? And that's the thing that Stephen was saying. The Republican Party are consistent when it comes down to stuff that I did. Don't back down when they know that they're wrong, and they double down when they know that what they're saying is bullshit. Excuse me, excuse my like BS, right? So the, he's been consistent, and 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 for that reason alone is why we're in a tight race today, right? For that reason alone, why we don't have a, a we we don't have a clear decided winner because he's been consistent. Now, de- Democratic people, they fly with the wind. One minute they consistent on one thing and then they don't, they don't stay consistent. Like, you know, they're always on defense. And that's not going to work for us anymore. Yeah, I ain't going to even say that they all, they, that they, they're like, um, it's, I don't know, they're consistently trying to be the nice guy in the room, right? Because you remember when Al Franken left in Minnesota, like when he gave up his seat because there was some photo of him kind of touching this woman's breast or whatever, and they forced him to leave and all that. Man, that one was a Republican. Yo, we, we got Republicans that was like, they had blackface. They they were accused of doing all kind of nonsense to their mistresses, all kind of, and they're like, I ain't going nowhere. They don't leave, but we pushed that guy out because he had a photo that looked like he was about to touch this chick boobs. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, that, so we're always trying to be like the nice one, and you know, that ain't gonna and, work and, right now. Fight the fight just- you win. No and, just, and just one last take, and, and this is just me again holding the Florida Democratic Party accountable. Gary Farmer literally said, there is no reason for the Florida House Victory and Senate Victory Fund to support any other candidate if they don't seem viable. That it just What he basically meant was, we might as well support Republicans who vote with Democrats. And I mean, that's great and dandy, but that's not the agenda we're pushing for. Mm-mm. And when we're looking at Florida, we have to realize after looking at the results, the $15 amendment passed and it shows that some progressive values hold strong. I didn't see not one establishment Democrat stick to that platform and hold strong to it because mm-hmm. one, they were scared that they were going to scare off the uh, small businesses. And on top of it, they were going to scare off the conservative folks. Honestly, truthfully, people matter. And people showed out yesterday and showed that they care more about, again, the policies that matter most to them and affect them in a more deeper meaning. And the fact that we as Democrats are scared to take this approach, it's, it's, it's a disservice. And, and additionally, we, I just want to talk about the fact that we contested every seat every single seat and that's thanks to dr janelle christensen who decided that we need to take a divide and conquer approach so we can actually stop the republican money machine had we not contested every seat i guarantee you republicans would have ran other uh, would have won other races with landslides because there was more money to be spent one thing we're doing as a democratic party here in florida we're not thinking about the offensive we continue to think that we have this moral high ground that we have to appease and it's not working for us. We need to realize at the end of the day, politics is politics, platitudes are platitudes and policy is policy. And we need to distinguish these facts. Character is everything, but at the end of the day, I wanna just highlight the fact that people voted based off of their religious conscience and religion has nothing to do with politics. God left us here with free will. And I'm only adding that point because, to be honest, there is no right or 
wrong answer at this moment. It is literally about what makes the most sense to us at this current moment. And for our party to not sit there and actually go towards the facts and actually talk about the issues that matter to folks, again, it's just a disservice because we, again, show that we are lacking any empathy. Even with the Latino voters, that has been the weakest link within the Biden campaign currently. And I say this because a lot of organizers are saying that we lack the resources in, in Miami-Dade. We lack the resources to communicate that Democrats are not socialists. We could have changed this narrative exactly. since literally the, the choice of the Democratic presidential nominee. We never did that. Nope. And even when the Democratic Socialists stumped for President Biden, hopefully that will be his title, he did not bring up the fact that socialism was a factor. All he brought up was the fact that these are the things that make sense now and work for us the best at this current moment in time. The things that are affecting us are the fact that we continue to lack the understanding of what a political regime means for us today. And until we really focus on what that means and we can explain that to our constituents in a way that is, and, and I'm sad to say it, but at a seventh grade level, and I don't mean that with disrespect. I mean that in the simplest of terms. We need to talk to our people in a matter that is reflective and completely understood without people feeling undermined. Right. We need to give the resources back to areas that feel like they are disheartened or cannot trust our party. We have to show them that we care enough to put in the effort. And that's the biggest flaw currently. And that's why a lot of these elected officials should either resign or they need to reconsider who their uh, their party leaders are. Because at this current moment in time, and I ran for state Senate District 33, and I'm not bitter, and I'm just saying it, and I said it on Facebook. We voted for a guy who slept on the state Senate floor. Exactly. That was not on purpose. That was intentional. And we need to realize where our priorities lie. It's not about it's more than what meets the eye, guys. We have to look past identity politics. We have to look at policy and what meets Even. us. And I just want to say this last thing. If nobody in this room, and I guarantee you nobody in Broward County, and I'll say not, not everybody, but a few people are making $400,000 a year. The Biden plan is not going to affect you. And if you feel like you're making $400,000 a year, please tell me where you live. This is a 30, I need to know. This is I want to know. <laughs> I want to be bought that life too. <laughs> um, to $50,000 a year, people who complain about this tax panel, it doesn't affect you. Like, it doesn't affect them. They just um, completely oh. missed the point. They're like, I'm missing a point. I'm like, he's not talking about you. And you cannot have a problem with Amazon having to pay more taxes. I mean, that, that dude is making like 180 bit. He's worth like $180 billion. If he has to give up 20 billion, that man's lifestyle is not changing. And why are you sympathetic exactly. to him? Why are you sympathetic to him? I don't get it. I want to go back over something that Steven said. So Steven was talking about um about Thurston, about Perry. And um, and I, you know, will admit again that I was the one who encouraged Steven to post um a picture of um of, of Thurston asleep on the Senate floor. Um, but with that being said. Not only did we reelect, not, not only did we put, put someone into office that was asleep, we put somebody back into office who doesn't even show up for work. Um, that has somebody that 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 has a proxy voting for him. Someone who is, you know, basically has a terminal illness. Um, on top of a on top of. That's, 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 I'm, talking talking about about yeah, I'm talking about people. Alcy. Talking about Thurston. I'm talking about Alcy. I'm talking. I'm saying not only did we did we put. Thurston back oh, in. Too. We, in we already, we, ex, in addition to that, so I, I think so. We're we're so we're so used to, and and this is a problem that I had in August. You know, with with the black community, we have these names that we're familiar with. Hey, Mr. And we we put people into oh. office. We put people into office continually based on the fact that we recognize their name, and we're not thinking about the future of the pot of the party. I am tired. You know, like. You know, I'm I'm not gonna mention any names. We've had we've had people die, you know. We've had people, you know, great leaders die, you know, in their seat so that they could, you know, lay in state, you know, and not thinking about what happens when they're gone. So it's like we're, we're thinking about our own political careers and not thinking about the party. 
And so that's one of the problems. The other problem that I see, and, I, and Stephen, everything that you said was, was 100% accurate, but there's more to it than that. The Democratic Party is not embracing the Democratic voters at all. And, and the totality of the Democratic voters. You know, I, had, I was having a brief, very brief conversation with a friend of mine on Facebook today, you know, just talking about the, the Black men who, who are completely left out of the conversation and then and then we want them to vote. You know, we we have we have completely disconnected. We all this talk about restoring, you know, the 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 rights to the felons so they could vote without talking about anything else that was important to them. You know what I mean? So what okay, so now we give them the right to vote. What what are they voting for? What what are we offering them? So we're we're completely disconnected um, from democratic voters. But yet we're asking, we're asking for the votes. I mean, obviously, when I say we, I'm not talking about me because I've never run for an office and never, I never will. But Democratic candidates are asking, you know, for votes from people that they are not giving anything to. We there's nothing being offered. There's nothing being offered. We you know other than I mean, over the last four years, what's being offered is to beat Trump, to beat Trump, to beat Trump. Okay, so what next? What happens? What happens in January? What happens January twenty first, when when they're dragging him out of the Oval? Then what? You know what 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 are we getting? What are we getting? You know, and we can't have Ice Cube, you know, dictating a plan. You know what I'm trying to say? What what are we getting? And and so there has to be there has to be more to the conversation. Um, there has to be more to the conversation, and we haven't even started having it yet. Right. right, and to segue into that, because Mr. Forbes is on now. How, Andrew, how are you? I'm well, how are you all doing this evening? Wonderful, uh, thank you for joining apologize us. Apologize for my tardiness, I had to wrap oh, up practice. Not at all. You're right on time, actually. Yeah. Um, okay. Great way to segue into uh, Black men, and one of the rumbles are, is like Black men were uh, essentially voting for Trump. A lot of the, you know, I guess there, there was some statistics, you know, some research done. Um, and so we invited Mr. Forbes to come in and have a conversation about that. Um, and, and talk to us about from a black male's perspective. Also, Stephen, you can jump in at any time um, from a you know, black male's perspective in terms of why you think the black men are voting for Trump and um, do you know any of them, number one. Number two, um, Carol just mentioned very clearly and I would and I have agreed and Sandra and I've had this conversation. We don't think the Democratic Party did a great job reaching out to the black male. Um, and, and, and trying to get them to come on board. And when they did decide to do it, they did it so late in the game, you were what, three weeks or four weeks out into election day. So um, thank you for coming on, Andrew. Give us your perspective. We're so before you start talking, I just want to say one thing. I mean, he may not understand why some a brother might vote for Trump, but one because one of the things I think are more concerning is because I have on my vote like a black woman t-shirt today, right? Because we consistently show up, right? Because you know, part of that is because we we've been having conversations the last couple of weeks about how black women are so disrespected, right? So we have we're we're in a mode that we always have to fight for ourselves, right? And I'm not gonna say brothers are comfortable, relaxed. I don't know what their what their issues is, but speak to why like half the time they don't even vote. They don't want to, a lot of them don't even want to vote, right? So you may, uh, you may be able to speak to that. Yeah, yeah. The, the fact that you're saying even uh, voting, black men voting is, is is a major issue with everything. Mm -hmm. uh, something that was mentioned before, where, you know, whether it's the party line or anything, I'm one that's an adverse voting party line uh, as a black man. I don't necessarily you know, I definitely don't vote for Trump, but didn't vote for Trump, but voting party line is almost, it's, it's, it's limiting what we need to do. The one thing that Ice Cube did have right was having a conversation with both sides. That's the one thing that he had correct is saying, okay, we need to have a conversation with both sides and see what is going to happen because to just vote party lines anymore today when the party lines are pretty much are there, there is no black line between democrat and republican right now because ultimately they're they're just going on their personal interest and in what's going to gain put keep them in, in in the position of power so we can't sit here and, and hold somebody accountable to just voting a party line any longer because the party lines are now it's, it's it's now great. 
there is no it, it is it is a mix it's, it's it's more of a purple it's no more red and blue as we as we traditionally looked at it when we were growing up and we were watching our parents go there was a distinct red and blue party now it's now it's a conversation of okay what is going to keep me in power so i i'm I, just, I don't uh, want to interrupt but I'm i want to anybody that would have Sorry about interrupting, but what type of issues do you think black men would need to make them vote for a particular candidate, right? So if it's not about party line, then it has to be issues. So like what type of issues do you think will resonate with black men to get them to go out and vote? Well, what's going to happen? I just want to add really quickly. Uh, what, what I would say is, because I, I have a few uh, black male friends, of course, that have told me that they would vote for Trump. And I asked them why they would do this. And after analyzing what they say from an abstractive point, what I understand, and even just looking from Ice Cube to Lil Wayne to all the black celebrity artists that are men who decided to support Trump, the biggest factor is they feel like there are no parties listening to the black community. And I personally, from my conversations with Republicans, their main reason again for voting for Trump was not because of his rhetoric or because they support who he is. They're just supporting the fact that there are policies that support him. And I believe from an abstractive point of view, that same, uh, that same ideology and rationale goes back to black male voters. Whatever is no, in it their doesn't make interest. any it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make and I and I heard what I heard what Mr. Forbes said. I hear what you're saying. I, I it doesn't make any sense to me because you know you're voting, you're voting for someone, you're supporting someone. So you have neither party who is who is supporting the black agenda, but you have one clear person who was in office that was that was detrimental to black lives. And so it it absolutely makes no sense to me. I mean, something we got to survive first and right. then vote. Now, the the well, first thing should be survival. When you have a president who is inciting the 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 the, the lynching of black men. It makes no sense to me that any black man can support him. I don't care. It, it, it can't be about money. It can't be about Carol, the male. It can't Carol. be about. It can't be about Carol. the male ego. It can't be about anything. The first Carol. thing we got to do is survive this. All right, Carol. Carol, Carol right, it goes right. back. You're, she's absolutely right, and I think that's what Mr. Forbes was going to say. But honestly, I think it goes back to the fact that you you made a good point, and it is money, and it goes back to the central premise. Uh, America runs on the ideal of capitalism. And but you got to be alive to spend it, Stephen. Yes, but you have no, to think about this too. The lowest common denominator, and this is the first thing I ever learned in philosophy, people do the last resort not because they want to, but because they are doing it to survive. And if we're going to, I'm not even going to stigmatize the black community, but those people who are going ahead and are selling drugs, who are sex workers, who are doing the things that us as a society would not deem as acceptable morally are doing it not because they want to, but they're doing it because this is their last form of survival. And this in retrospect, if whoever's in power is going to give us the best solution, this is the central premise of why people are supporting another individual. Not for the simple fact that they're Republican or Democrat. It's the same reason why P. Diddy is making his own party. Not because he doesn't think the Democratic Party, the Republican Party aren't doing a job. He just believes that they're not doing the job that is concerned to the Black voters. And that is why he's doing it. For the simple fact that somebody needs to address the real concerns and issues of the Black community. But I want to go ahead and let Mr. Forbes go ahead and add on to that, because I feel like he'd give us a better insight. Well, what, what happens, what's happened with the black men, like you, what uh, unfortunately what, what, what's been drilled in the head is money, money is what matters. And like you said, you, you know, I, I fully agree with you that we, we're dealing with a, you know, the, city, the current city president of 45 that, you know, doesn't matter, does, he doesn't care one way whether we live or die. But what we're dealing with is the fact that we've been drilled into our head that money is what makes it happen. And and unfortunately, 45's only agenda and the only thing that he has pushed is the ability to make money and we're making money and the, and the economy is doing better. The black man that has been more or less pushed out of any money-making industry or any money-making opportunities is now looking at, okay, well, this at least this guy is setting up a system where, okay, if I make my money, I can keep my money and I have my money. And that's where we've lost, we've lost the, the general interest and general understanding that that we don't that chasing money is an illusion. You know, but in America, they teach us, especially in the black community, 
We hear it from, we've heard it from the young black man. I got to get up and make my money. I got to go chase this dollar. You know, every everything is money, money, this, money, this, money, that. So when you when you talk about who's going to help them make money, the businesses aren't doing it. The schools aren't doing it. You know, their women, their women are dying them because they don't have money. So if they hear this one person that comes out and says, hey, this is how I can help you make money, you know, even though we all know it's nonsense, is something at least somebody now is telling them, hey, we're going to help you make money. We're meanwhile, going to show you Meanwhile, you there were money. several black men hanging off trees and it was, be it was being declared suicide. I mean, come right. on. At, at, which, at which point? At which point do we stop making it about money? At which At which point do we stop doing that? Here's the man who called, you know, um, Colin Kaepernick a, a, a motherfucker, okay, or son of a bitch. That's what he called him, a son of a bitch. Oh, son of a bitch. Yeah, you know, all, all the, all the mean, son of bitches. Keep yeah, son, son, of, yeah. son of bitches. These, these this man is so disrespectful to black men, and I'm sorry. There, we, there's none of us. There, there's point. Zero 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 one percent of black men that have enough money in this country to 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 pique his interest. So it's so so when he's when he's given that spill, it's not to the the sex worker, the black man who's a who, who who's a pimp. It's not to the black man who's selling drugs, who's making money that he might be ghetto rich. But th this what Trump isn't doing anything to support the ghetto the ghetto rich Negro out there, you know, hustling. He's not doing anything. No, what he's selling no. is not for them. No, he's not. What they're, they're, what they're not seeing, but all there is is the fact that, okay, this man's showing, this, this man's talking about money. They're not looking at the the interest or the actual amount. They're just talking about the money. And unfortunately, in the black community, the black men, why they do have to, you know, sell out their neighborhoods, sell out their brothers, sell out their families for the dollar. You know, I guess, so them I guess moms, that's why you're. Kids, you know, I guess that's why you're here because that, I can't even understand. I, I guess that's why you're here to give us a different perspective because there's absolutely no way I can get from where I'm at to being able to reason why a black man would support this bigot. This let me ask a question. Before, before, you, before you ask a question, before you Wait, ask a question, question. Because last time I was trying to ask a question, I missed this is my point. Let me ask this question: Do you think the fact that Trump don't give no f's? right? Like he cares about nothing, right? Do you think that's what's attractive to black men? Because he do whatever he want to do, how he want to do it, when he want to do it, right? There's no more, he's not considering no morality in his behavior. If he got to deal with cooks and criminals and cons to get what he want, he does it. Is any of that attractive? You know what I mean? To a, to a, it has to be because it can't be the money. I would say, I would say that it's, I'll tell you wholeheartedly, I'll tell you wholeheartedly, they, they, they don't they don't necessarily agree with his attitude and most black men don't don't agree with his attitude and don't agree with what he, it really comes down to the fact that he just talks about money and i would tell you that is that is what is hurting and, and, for, and whenever you hear whenever you hear any black person speak or any black leader in our community speak they always talk about okay our reparations or put, putting money to the community or putting money here or, and that's all they talk about how are we going to get paid back what are we, and, and we're not seeing that, you know, money is actually in the black community. Money is within our hands. We, we've been, we've been given money. The opportunity is just what we're, what we're missing is a, is a sense of how to spend the money. It doesn't matter if we throw, if we, if they throw that $500 billion into the black community, it'll be gone in three years. It does not matter if we don't have the sense enough to spend the money correctly. The money is there. What the black man has been, is feeling like he doesn't have the money because and it's, it's a combination of things because we are being majority of us are locked out of the better jobs, you know, I, through, 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 you before, know, before we continue, I just want to, cause there's some people on the, uh, on when the ones that we're sharing or whatever people are commenting and I want to be able to kind of in, insert people as they comment. So Tay Ford, who's on my page, um, mentioned a lot of black men were and are Trump curious. And it's because they thought Trump was some great businessman they would benefit from. She also, right. she also answered your question, Sandra, that she says she thinks, she does think that um, that makes him semi-attractive to black men because he comes off hood. Um, based on I, what you said, Sandra. <laughs> 
I'm, listen, I, I would just let the, people, add, let the people get in to get in where they fit in, child. Thank you, Tay. Go ahead, Stephen. I, I would just say that I feel like this is merely a facet of Trump's personality and who he is because he's not the polished politician. I, I've heard Republicans say if he was a little bit more polished in his rhetoric, he would be the perfect politician because he's saying the right things in just a different way. What I think this goes back to is the prisoner's dilemma, which basically is the, the problem of choice and what is the best choice moving forward for an individual. And in the prisoner's dilemma, the solution is to be selfish. That solution is always going to be the best answer moving forward for oneself. And if anybody's not, um, you know, uh, knowledgeable on this uh, topic, just look into it. It's a very simple question. It's more like if you were to go to prison and you had three choices, you're going to pick the best option that's going to benefit you to have the least, uh, the law, the least uh, amount of sentencing. And this is the similar thing when it comes to politics. What is the best choice moving forward? What is the most selfish aspect that's gonna benefit me in the long run? And then we can even go ahead and uh, equate this to ethical egoism because it goes back to the central premise that I, even though I'm an egoist, I am not um, selfish for myself. I may be doing things that are beneficial to me, but that also help the community. And I think that goes back again with the black community, especially black men, um, just for the fact that, uh, again, these are just facets of who Trump is, but the fact that capitalism is such an egregious form of a political regime, it has always um, constituted the idea that if you have economic freedom, you as an individual will have the liberties that all people have. Uh, Jay-Z has said it, in the sense that he says that we need to talk about generational wealth, we need to talk about um, not worrying about throwing money in strip clubs, but to actually have credit. I mean, these are things that Black men understand, but it's hard for us to attain because like Mr. Forbes said, it's not that we don't have the money in the community. It's the fact that the opportunities are limited to us. And for Trump to continue to spew the same rhetoric saying that I'm going to give you the opportunity. I created economic opportunity zones. It's the same way that he told Latin voters, Democrats are socialists. If you vote for Joe Biden, this is going to be socialism. If you vote for Joe Biden, a black woman is going to be the president, not Joe Biden. These things are things that intimidates voters and people are not ready for. Some people have experienced it and have a negative connotation on these experiences. And I, I would personally say that as a black man myself, I've never found Trump attractive due to his rhetoric. But if you were to take away those negative aspects and to make him a polished politician, and he's a true liar, a true manipulator, somebody who's really for himself, he's not speaking things that are wrong on, in terms of the, Republic, uh, the, the Republican Party's ideals, which is economic freedom. I mean, we've done it with China. We're doing it with Africa. We are pushing this idea that capitalism will give you um, redistribution of wealth and you yourself have the chance to be a Jeff Bezos. It may take years, it may take time, but you have the ability to attain it. And that's all black people want to know and, and want to achieve and have is the chance to actually have a future for themselves. So, so do you, uh, so, so are you saying, um, and Mr. Forbes, you can answer this question. So, um, this, these, these last four years, um, you know, and I, I just want to see, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. So those who are those men who have made a decision to vote for Trump, um, are, is, it, is it fair to assume that they had um, some economic breakthrough, therefore they feel like they want to continue on for another four years? Because I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what the connection is. I mean, was there benefits? Um, this, these last four years, why they feel like, you know what, this is the guy I'm going to go with. Like, you know, it has to, there has to be something, um, if it's to the point of money, there has to be something that connects them to make that decision to vote for him. So do you have this last, have these last four years been beneficial for black men? And, and Uh, it has not been beneficial for black men. An 80-year-old black man said, you know, that he, walk, he went through. Uh, I did hear an 80-year-old black man that went through the civil rights and went through everything, and he said, I don't give a damn that Trump's a racist. I made money this year. I made money over the last wow. years. And that, that, you know, that that's a disappointment. A black man that went through and, and fought for civil rights and was getting sprayed by water hoses and arrested for sit-ins. 
And he said, well, I don't give a damn that he's racist. I made money this year. And we look at it, how often do we get belittled as black men based on our financial situation? You know, based on, based on what's going on and what we have in our pockets. And so often, so when you get somebody that's telling you, hey, even though the benefit has not been there, it truly has not been there for the black male, it's been at, for nobody in America on that, on really on that note, unless you're wealthy, but especially for the black male to say, okay, well, we're going to give you the opportunity to make money. When oftentimes that's how we are judged as black men based on what we have in our pockets. You know, you see, you see a black man that's trying to, that's trying to spend time with his children and the black woman says, no, you can't because you haven't paid your child support. You know, that he's being shut out. So, okay, what do I need to do? I need to make more money if I want to spend time with my child, even though all I want to do is spend time. And we hear that story too often. We see those, we see those situations when you have somebody, you know, no matter how, how flimsy the lifeline is, if you're drowning and somebody throws you uh, uh, um, any kind of line, you're going, to, you're going to try and grab it, you know? And it's, it's unfortunate that that's the line that, that's the hook that's gonna always bait the black man because of the situation that, that society, that our, our general society has put him in. You know, you know we, I, I just also wanna add really quickly, just really quickly, I just wanna say this too. The one other thing that I've realized within the black community, there's, uh, there's this, again, and, and Carol, you did say this, there's this idea of tokenism and of identity politics. And another way that this is happening, not even through just economic and financial means, is through religious aspects of it. I mean, I and I think we've all seen it on social media and through actual famous Black individuals that some people, and I mean, even through our own community, are voting for Trump specifically on the idea of of, of his religious beliefs, that oh he is God. a Christian oh man. God. And, and, are you and, kidding? Is this a and, joke? No, this is oh, serious. Religious beliefs. I'm that's saying the that, I mean, that's, that's, that's the connection to the party. Y'all go to church. What y'all well, talking about? evangelism. <laughs> I just want to say this, and, and it's a real thing because at the end of the day, Black Americans are, and, and I don't want to go ahead and discriminate or go ahead and stigmatize any group, but we are a majority of Black individuals who go ahead and follow the Christian faith. And even though he's um, from a denomination of the Christian faith, people believe that we have to vote or that our Christian faith aligns us with these politicians. And this is why identity politics doesn't work and why religion has no place in politics, because it's it, for one, it's a misnomer. Two, it's something that plays on our our, mor our moral beliefs, which have nothing to coincide with what's happening within our day to day lives. Um, if anything, it's just a form of what's going on with uh, within our everyday lives. I, I mean, religion is just a part of who we are, and religion sadly, hasn't, religion hasn't been part of our um, democracy since Obama saying "Amazing Grace" at the funeral. So but that's the thing, though, the so fact that he says that he's pro-life and he's he's Christian and that's why he I, believes I wanna, in everybody's life. It's just, again, a, a misinterpretation of what religious values are. And that's the biggest problem within American politics. I want to address something um, that Mr. Forbes said, re referring to the 80 year old gentleman who, you know, fought during uh, the civil rights um, movement and is now supporting the idiot in chief. Um, because he has, he's never made more money than he's than he's made during this last four years. This is the this is the Chitlin um, mentality. Okay, this is the Chitlin mentality. This is the reason why we, you know, we we think that eating pig intestines is good. Whatever they whatever they're willing to throw on the floor for us to eat, you know, we'll eat. So yeah, hey, you know, like, okay, Carol. You know, I like to interrupt you, right? Go ahead. I'm not mad at the people that 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 made chitlins taste good. I don't eat it. But what I'm saying is that no, you know how like um, no, it, it, it's the mentality that we that we will get we will take whatever we will put no, up with whatever we have to garbage. Don't, 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 don't talk bad about that. That's ingenuity, right? So they give you trash and you made it into a treasure. People paying all kinds of money to eat that mess right now, right? So that's ingenuity. Don't, don't knock that, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not, but, but, I, but I'm knocking it, but I'm knocking it because right? it's like, so like Stockholm Syndrome. Scraps, they threw you like Stockholm Syndrome out of it, okay? So that right there is ingenuity and that's survivorship and we can't be mad at that. Yeah, well, we, we're, good at that. We, we, we're, good, we're good at that. We're good at that. 
So do you want to continue to be in a position where we're getting scraps? No, we don't. But, but that's don't what we're doing, folks. That was that's able doing. to make scraps into a delicacy. That's all I'm saying. That, that's great, well, George. Washington well, Carver did a well, great well, job with that with the peanut. But we can't. But we I cannot keep praising the master for throwing scraps at us. Right. At that. At that point. And, and, and we're the ones out there farming for the food. Well, what, what Carol and I and, and and I do agree with this. At, at what point do we get off of the surviving? And get into the thriving. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, there there, there is survival, and then there's thriving. There, 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 those are two completely different things that we're not understanding. That. We 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 are so used to surviving that we don't understand the opportunity to thrive when it's there. We don't understand what it takes. The back the backbone of the backbone of the black community and the black man has been the support of his woman. Plain and simple. That has what that has been the main that what when that motivated black man when that was his primary motivated factor was his woman and his family that's when we were thriving that's when and if you look at the greatest economic growth in black history was was after slavery partially because we were the only ones that were skilled workers at the time and so we we were able to do things so once the slaves were free we made a, immense immense uh, financial growth because now they had to pay us. Yes, they were still paying us far less, but we were the only ones that could get paid for doing these jobs because we were the only ones that knew how to do these jobs. So we had great economic growth and how many slaves went after finding their kids, finding their wife and, and reconnecting their family. We looked at that economic growth and that's what led up to us having the ability to, okay, build a Tulsa, Oklahoma, because that was within what, 50 years post-slavery when all of that was going on. So we looked at the economic growth that happened in that first 50 years post-slavery and what was the driving factor behind it. Once we, once the driving factor was taken away, our, our focus, our motivation was changed to just getting the money and not saying, okay, let me take care of what I need to take care of. It became just a survival mentality. And, and we, and we, 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 uh, the regress digress back to just a survival mentality of taking the scraps that's being thrown at us. But we're now, not, but we're not even surviving this. I mean, it goes back to what I was saying. And I and I and I and I stick by what I said about this, about just about, you know, we, we're gonna eat whatever they give us. And and it's and it's BS because we're basically we're, we're basically, you know, I'm not knocking it, but my point is that we cannot keep allowing ourselves to get to get beat lynch and then whatever they give us we'll take we you know we we have to be able to have this survival mentality we're missing the whole survival part it goes back to what i was saying about how many how many times did this man incite violence against black men against black people particularly oh, black oh, men I, I, so I this survival mentality we're, we're, we're leaving out the survival part you, you know you know what I, i'm gonna make a point on that because i remember i like i um there's a um i think the it's either like super cat or um he he had a song with beyonce he there's a line in the song that says a promise is a comfort for a fool right there's a line in the song promises a comfort for a fool when i heard that line it changed my life right because what trump does is that he's always promising to do something and people believe him. Like even having Mexicans, he, like having Mexico pay for the wall. <laughs> listen, I'm telling you, even though he's a lot, okay, listen, most of us stayed in relationships because the dude promised that he was going to do better the next time, right? So he makes us that promise. We'd be like, okay, and then you give him another chance, right? So this is really like being in a toxic, you know, a toxic relationship. A promise is a comfort for a fool. He, and, and then the fact that and then he, he, he lies so easily right and so smoothly people think of it as truth right oh i gave all this money to um to to um to black colleges i gave you know i done made more jobs for black people than anybody ever had he says this thing ain't nobody really fact checking him on it and if they are the person who heard the lie never hit a that the fact check is that's not true and then that's that's how he keeps doing this because he keeps making these promises on what he's gonna do and people are forgetting like bruh you had five years already not five years you already had four years to do all of this stuff and you've done nothing right they're not holding him accountable for the fact that he had the time to do all of the things that he's promising to do but that making a promise to someone is big and i think that's part of what 
keeps you know men of color and like all of these other the other folks i think they got other reasons why they support him but i think at least with men of color who support him is that is that he's making these promises to them and they want to believe it right they were particularly those who voted for him before right because sometimes when you're already invested you be like well i got i mean i don't put in all this time so i gotta you know give them a chance that they say they're gonna make it work right again if we go back to relationships you done been with dude for three four years he telling you he gonna be all right you gonna be like well i might as well give him another chance that he gonna be all right since i already done put in three years and i think some of that like that what keeps folks in relationships that are not good for them is some of what keeps people well, I would agree. I don't know. Is that it? Well, no. Well, I would agree with you on that, but the the the. the I'm just saying. I don't know. I'm trying to understand it. The, spe the specificity on black men voting for Trump, right? Because, and I didn't want to come on here to bash black men, and I think that we I'm shouldn't. I feel like. Oh, oh, yeah. No, you're not. I, I wholeheartedly believe I, because it looks like I might start to, so I don't want people thinking that's what I was going to do. But wholeheartedly, I wanted to say is that number one, the Democratic Party did nothing zilch zero to engage exactly. black men. That's number one. Nothing at all. Number two, um, white uh, black women, um, you know, because there was a lot going on on social media, started start, started coming out bashing black men, saying, you know, we carry y'all, we do this, we do all that, whatever. And here you go, you know, y'all vote for him or whatever. We the most disrespected race, the disrespected gender, and all yeah. that other stuff. And while while there is justification on both sides. I want to be very clear that um, what Sandra, Carol, and I try to do is get the perspective to be able to have a conversation about it in context, right? And so when Steven mentioned um, and Andrew also kind of, uh, con you know, just justified this about being money, money more driven, and let's let's just be let's just be clear, women, we 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 not only think. Um, logically, but we also think emotionally, right? Men is always this linear logic kind of, they always see things linear, objective wise, um, and, and the, the goal is always in the front and that's how they think, right? And so when I ask the question about how it's been beneficial, um, I can see why, um, I don't understand it, but I can see why black men would choose to align themselves with 45 like and and, and I, I, everything is about learning and understanding right however with that being said um there needs to be a conversation with black men though yes there needs to be a there, there, yes. then there, there needs to be there, needs, there truly needs to be an honest conversation and, and one and unfortunately it, it, it needs to be one that's not not emotionally charged mm -hmm. i mean because once once emotion gets involved the black man does time does then check out once it becomes an emotional thing, he tends to check out and does not want to hear anything else that's being said. You know, we, because like you said, we are linear. We like to think and just talk. Okay, our mind works in problem solving. Okay, if she's if she's arguing about going out to dinner, we're thinking, okay, I can't pay for dinner. You know, and when she says, okay, why well, can't you take me out to dinner? We're thinking, you, well, I can't pay for dinner. We're not thinking about, okay, we're not looking at it and, and, and the woman saying, well, why don't you spend time with me? You know, we're looking at okay, why aren't we going out to dinner? And oh, and that comes back to okay, well, you never take me anywhere. You never take me anywhere. You know, and it comes down to okay, I can't afford to take you anywhere. Then that's how. Then that's how that that conversation. That's how that conversation tends to go. You, know? you just solve some relationship problems right there. No, right. just solve. Uh, I, I can think. I can think of ten different relationships you just healed in that by that one conversation. Right. And, and, and really is. It really is being clear. Being clear on what. Be, and that's why I say take a. It takes an honest conversation. Yeah. You know, and saying, okay, hey, why why don't we spend time together? You know, versus why don't you take me? Why don't you ever take me anywhere? Those are two different conversations. Yeah. You ask yeah. Man, why you take me anywhere? Okay. Thinking, I, it's gonna cost you some money. I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna interrupt you for a minute because it's on the point that you're making, Mr. Forbes. There's a comment. We have Dan Miller said, black boys are not taught financial literacy in school or home, how, you know, how they form corporations or whatever. But he made another point about their um, black black men are not taught history in school, right? We go to school, then we don't, we, the, you know, the, 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 what you were talking about, about how like, you know, when they were the breadwinners of the family, the families were stronger, they were looking for their kids. Like that part is not taught, right? Like we're not taught our history um, in schools, and I think some of that may be problematic. Definitely, the, our education system in the United States is problematic. 
and that's 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 a com that's a conversation. Well, it's, 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 it's definitely you it was. You I, and, I'm, and I and I really we gotta come back and talk about this. Probably you you said something about like you know like black men was something about when they had their families you know the family was together um when they were taking care of their women you know that's a conversation for another day because we 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 also talk um one of the populations that we have to talk about and we're gonna put blame we're gonna have to give assign some blame to what's happening with this election cycle is like white women right and they tend to just kind of find themselves uh in everything right. Uh, that it's, I, 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 there's a there's a relationship um situation we can talk about that they're gonna they're gonna have to take some ownership on what's happening with this election in terms of like the way they vote so we are here to talk about black men today and like because that they were trying to make you seem like oh no they over there voting for trump and if something happened we're gonna blame it on them but you know the data is is saying some very different things today it's saying some very different things um and white women are gonna have to take some responsibility with that they're gonna have to take some responsibility with some of the stuff that's happening with relationships too. But I'm gonna have to get fee or whatever so we can have a different conversation on that and see how that impacts um, our, our families, like um, you know, black families. And I, I think it does. I just want to say this then to, to address it really quickly. So the same way that we learn about the Holocaust, yeah, that, that was through straight pure lobbying. The Jewish community which is heavily diverse because there are many people who are Jewish pushed the government to talk about it. The one thing that we are lacking when we're talking about history, it's not the, the fact that we don't recognize or, or acknowledge it. It's the fact that nobody, and, I, and not, let me not just say nobody, it's been hard for Black representatives, especially the few Black representatives, to push this topic out there. Everything we learn about today is whitewashed. Mm -hmm. my, my, yes. my little brother had a topic the other day about American to... history mm -hmm. and his project was about Abraham Lincoln. And mm -hmm. I was there and my mom said, what do you, what is your take on Abraham Lincoln? And I said, well, he's a racist. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, my mother's from the island. So I mean, she doesn't know much about American history, but her whole thing was he liberated the slaves. And I said, that's great that he did that, but he didn't do that genuinely. If we look at the history, there was, was some political the motive together. there. It was to keep the nation together, not to- Exactly. Them. Political <laughs> motives are not moral imperatives. We exactly. have to distinguish those two things. So exactly. I want to push this thing again. Jewish people, the Jewish community did lobby the government to make sure we acknowledge the fact that Holocaust happened. It was the reason why World War II was a thing. It was a reason why they are dis, um, disproportionately um, dispersed around the globe and why they are such a heavily connected community because they have a centralized theme to connect that's themselves. That's the point I wanted and to black Dan Miller had posted. That's that? the comment I wanted to address. Dan Miller right. about that. How the moment black people address those things from every root of what racism and slavery did to us, that is when we can have the conversation of what it means to be black in America, what it means to be a black person in the world. I mean, in Africa, they don't even have these labels. They're just Africans. And that's how you, that's the disconnection between our roots and from where we came from. And th that, that's all I'm going to say, but I, I'm pretty sure Mr. Forbes has something else to add, but I'm just saying we have to push harder for legislation to acknowledge what being black, African-American being from a descent of the African culture truly means because there's it's, it's diverse, it's deep. And we only talk about it in college when you decide to pick it as a major. And that's that that's ridiculous. And I want to make every respect. When you look when you look at the history of how Mrs. when you look at the history of how one point. Let me make this one point. So I wasn't born here. I was born in the Bahamas, right? And when I and I came here really young. And when I came and people started calling me black, I was confused. I was like, what does that mean? I'm like, I'm Bahamian, right? I was like, I'm Haitian Bahamian. Like, why are you calling me black? I was like, are you calling me black because I'm dark skinned? I don't understand. So the point that Steven is making is real. And I mean, like, I came in, I just didn't understand. I'm like, what, why y'all calling people black? Like, aren't you like just American? But I was Haitian Bahamian and I kept saying that. And they're like, no, but you black. And I'm like, now I understand it. I mean, I understand it because I've been here long, you know, by the time I got to high school, they I kind of understood like, yo, that's just how they're going to see you when you walk in a room. Nobody's going to talk about the fact that you're Haitian Bahamian. But it was something that, um, you know, we just, you know, we just, I just didn't deal with it until I came to the United States. Because in the Bahamas, we have like Chinese, white people, black people, everybody, and everybody just behaving. Nobody gets into like what you look like. That, that breakdown just doesn't, it doesn't exist. This is, this is something that's really like an American thing, you know? Yes, 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 it is. 
Yes, it is definitely an American thing because I'm on Jamaican. We didn't have that same issue. I was born in Jamaican. We didn't have those same issues. But when we look at it, when we look at it here in in America, the idea of black black history is taught as you know you were enslaved by the white man, then you were free by the white man. And that's so it. We, had, we we did we did nothing for ourselves at no point in time. There was nothing. We had nothing to stand on. And now and now we're being taught, and we're we're actually being taught that that we need to, we, we, that once again, the only thing that, the only way that you're free in America is to be wealthy. You know, we, it goes back to 1990s when, when, when they were doing lifestyles that are free, love the rich and famous and look how the other half lives and everything like that. And they, they, and that's been, that's been the overwhelming theme of what they're pushing right now down everybody's throat. When you look at, when you truly look at how black lives and black Black lives really grew and proliferated is when we were working together. The idea of two separate bank accounts is not a black thing. We were always community based. We were always family based. We were always reliant on each other. If you take it all the way back to Africa, we were always reliant on each other. But now we look at it and this it has separated us to the point of our woman says, okay, well, I have this, I have that. And the man says, well, I have. I have this, I have that. And if she has more than what he has, then he's now belittled and not looked at that as still being a man. You know, you're just here. You're just here. Do your part, shut up, and that's what it is. And when you have something with now you have somebody that's that throws out there on the table that we could possibly equal the playing field because we look, we goes back to education. When we look at school, when we graduate, when I graduated high school. They still had shop class. They still had, you know, you could come out and be a plumber. You could come out and be a, a, a certified uh, carpenter, a, cert a certified mechanic coming out of high school. Nowadays, you know, all those programs have been removed from school, and that goes back to the election, our, our process of voting, you know, where we don't vote for these local things that can put those things back in school. Because now the black man only, the black man's only idea of getting to college is you better be able to shoot a ball, dribble a ball, and tackle somebody large. Exactly. You know, that's that's the only way that we're not, our black boys are seeing as, okay, how do I get to college? You know, the idea of a black boy being being told that he, you know, at, at, from an academic standpoint, you can you can grow, that's out the window because the only black men that we're seeing going to college are the black boys that's on the field, you know, or on the court. We're not seeing them doing anything else. We're not, they're not given the opportunity. They're not even looked at as an idea that, hey, academically, now the black woman, if the black girl is smart, she is, she is, she is lifted up. She is supported. She is, she is looked at and, and, and praised for her intelligence. If a black man is running around here in honors classes, he's talked about, he's dogged, and he's asked why he don't play football, why he don't run track, you know, what's going on. So we, when we look at the, just the disparity of how they talk to the black man and the black female, it's a it, it, it's a big disparity of how we're treated just in that within that society in itself, because a a, a, a black a black woman in honest classes is praised. A black man, and I was in honest classes. I was in honest classes, so I, I I understand that. Hey, man, you in this smart ass classes? What's wrong with you? You know, what's wrong with you in the smart yardy classes with all the practice? You know, now you know this, that, the other. Now I was I was talked about that way, but the black girls that were in that class with me, they weren't they weren't talked to they weren't talked to in that manner. They were never they were never denigrated for being intelligent. Whereas we are. So when we when we even do the things that's that that should be done, there's a negative stigma that comes along with it. It's almost like a no-win situation. Hey, I'm smart, but well, no, nah, that, that ain't good enough. So you know, you, part of what is, is the fact that Trump giving black men attention part of why they were supporting him? Because some of the things you're saying is like, okay, you know, if you get the right kind of attention, you know, you you know, you you might they they might just do what it is that you want just because they're getting that attention. Is that some of it, right? Because he, that, that is, he that gave is. him attention. Is that way he gave me some attention? So I'm gonna vote for him. I'm about to be on. I would, I would rephrase it and more. I would rephrase it more in the sense of utility because, and if we go back to a historical context, mm -hmm. slavery has pushed the black male and the black community to understand themselves as a tool. And mm -hmm. I say this in the sense of where Mr. Forbes says that 
black men are relying on the idea of their athletic ability and skill. We're not doing that on purpose. We're doing that because that's the narrative that's portrayed to us. Right. When we look at the NBA, it's predominantly black. When we look at the NFL, it's predominantly black. If you're from Florida and you're playing football, you're no, you, everybody's going to say, oh, I'm Florida bred. You know, I, I am a real football player. And it's not because of the connotation that, that it's good. It's for the fact that there's opportunity. And like how Sandra was saying, in some respects, yes, there is a tension, but in other aspects of it, it's more so that this is the best way for me to get out of the situation that I'm in, to utilize myself and the best interest for my community, for my family, and for myself. And it's a sense, it's a sense of validation. I mean, that's, that's, that's where it comes from. You know, uh, unfortunately, a black man is either is, is normally only praised if he's a great athlete or if he has a lot of money. So if somebody tells you, hey, we're going to we're going to put you on the field, we're going to put you on the court or we're going to put money in your pocket. Why not take that? Because those are the only ways that we are praised. We aren't even praised for, you know, you know, you, you see we see it all over social media every day. They don't want they want the dude that's going to be that's got a little hood in him, got a little thug in him, going to take care of him, going to go ahead and step up and handle this. You know what I'm saying? They don't they don't want they don't want the man that's going to say, OK, well, babe, maybe we should not go here because I, there might be a problem. You know, well, I prefer, that, that, that I prefer my husband makes... when he's cuddling with our dog. So this, this I don't, I don't, I don't get down. <laughs> I don't get down with either one of those. With I, I like, I like nice guys, and I'm, and I'm sure I'm not the only black woman um, that does that. Like I said, I like my husband best when he's when he lets the dog in the bed and he cuddles with the dog. So and he's not an athlete or rich. So. But, but some of what, but, I mean, yeah. But Carol, you could also admit that you like your man I, to be strong in public. Okay. See, I, have a little hood in the I didn't marry no little scrawny guy. I didn't marry no scrawny guy. But then, but then, not always. But then, you know, I've always known that being. Oh, so I was raised that you know, okay, if I if this don't make sense, it don't make sense. Why why am I going to go over here where the where the trouble is, you know? Mm -hmm. That's why I don't understand. That, that's why I don't understand the Trump vote. Like y'all going over there with a the Trump. That's where the trouble is at. You know what I mean? This dude like, that said, that's, when you arrest them, but, but, hit their head up against the um the roof of the car." Yeah, it's, 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 it's the same way that the Democratic Party thought that oh, because Trump is perceived as racist or xenophobic and all that, that people aren't gonna like him. It's just a naive concept to think that people are gonna dislike somebody for who they are. I mean, Maya Angelou said, I mean, if, if they show you your colors, you might as well accept it, you mm -hmm. know? And and Trump has mm -hmm. never played fake to who he is. And, and I'm just gonna, and I think right. people That's respect true. that. And it's the same thing in the Republican party. People are like, I don't care that don't he's this way. It, but it's true. Yeah, but I mean, look, think you about it, Carol. Me, if he says something, if he says something racist like it, but today, you you're gonna be like, "That's true." <laughs> be who he is, y'all. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a different right, and and that's the, like Carol. The, the, the difference between respecting it, like I don't like it, but I respect. I respect. The, I respect. You know, who he is. He's shown. He's showing me who he is. Right. Not to say that I'm. I, I don't support him in any way. But mm -hmm. I can respect the fact that at least I, I, it ain't fake. You know what you're dealing you know, with. I don't like I've it. I said that before. That he is authentic. You know, right. said that before. So, I don't respect him, but he is authentic. Right. So, so yeah, I, and I don't mean to cut you off, Andrew. I just want to kind of put it out there because some um, Felicia mentioned in the comments about how do we start engaging black men um, to. So you know, what do that look like? That they were engaged. Um, I, I, I have like, a great idea. <laughs> I have a great idea. We <laughs> we and and, and how to do this. Listen, and, and, and it's been said, Chevron Jones said it. it, it's a it's an idea. And I think it's a great idea. I've never seen one person who canvasses for any political party in the hood. I've never seen mm -hmm. any person in the political process talk to people in the ghetto. And I'm saying all these terms because this is what people think of the black community and, and the, uh, the minority community. The ghetto in the hood is not where you need to be. It's dangerous, right? Well, I guarantee you, if the right candidate at the right time with the right motivation were to sit there and knock on everybody's door in the hood and said, I want your vote and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do for you, a black people in there 
people of color there are going to listen. But not the because they're need, sitting there like, oh, you're bothering me, but because they, they want to, they, they feel important now. But I will, I will say, ask them what they exactly. need, though, right? You can't go in there telling them what you're going to do. You need we to need, ask them what you we need. We need hood registration drive. We need ghetto town halls. Put that on the list for our meetings. Put that on the list for our meetings. Let me say this. Let me say this. Stephen and Sandra. Sorry. But that's was going that's not where i was going no that but is asked, this is how to engage them it's how to engage but, them but, but I, said, let her finish the question. I said black men not just people in the hood no, but right. I, that's what right. I, I want to make this one point and, and then I, I'm gonna hold on me. 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 okay what steven said about like going into the community that's important we need to find out what they need and someone needs to provide that service one of the things that happened was that felons were allowed to vote this year right they were allowed to vote and it's a lot of those dudes that's living in miami on 12th avenue 15th avenue 17th avenue that was eligible to vote right but ain't nobody go and talk to them they probably still don't they probably don't even know that they could vote right now right no one engaged that community and i think that's important and that's a difference maker that's one of the things that need to happen well and i agree with that and 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 for those that for that group i totally agree that we need to be more engaging but i'm talking about those who've made the right. decision to vote for trump how do we engage that group? i, I would tell you i would tell you the number i would tell you the number one thing that it, that it takes nowadays for the black man is to listen to the black man I mean, ultimately, no one ever listens to the black man. No one ever actually listens to what the black man is saying. You know, um, it, it's it's amazing. We we uh, I looked at the Bible verse the other day that was talking about the the, the ten virgins that that went and five of them didn't have the oil for their lamp, and the other ones did have the oil for the lamp, and the five got shut out because they didn't have the oil for their lamp. And that you know that that parable is a parable, not just being prepared but it's also a parable of okay what were they missing they're missing what they needed to see you know and a lot of times a lot of times we, we will watch something but we don't see it if you know what i mean some people watch football and like I, i'm a coach i i don't i don't watch football i see football mm -hmm. as a coach you know i look at it differently you know a lot of times we hear we hear the black man but we don't listen to the black man and that's part of the part of the issue when we you know the black man when he goes home he wants to talk he's talking to his woman she she's not she don't she's not listening to him she hears him she hears what he's, he, he's saying but she's not listening to him you know we're not ultimately listening about listening to what their what their desires are you know when the black man says okay he, he's saying i need opportunity i need a job you know i need a job i need to be able to take care of what's going on and when he says that it's always talked about well just go go out there and get a job well how do I do that? You know, if he's telling you, if he's telling you that that I need a job, that means he's already, most men have already taken the time to explore how to get a job and have been turned down or have been shut down. So he says, I need it. Okay, he's saying, well, how, help me. Help me. How do I get through that door? You know, and, and a lot of times the black woman is in that situation, in that better situation, and is accepted more to be able to, 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 to help show him that in society and how to, and how to work, how to maneuver those, Are you saying those, 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 those pitfalls. So do you think that women, women should have, should have start having these conversations and or uh, with black men to kind of figure out where they, where they fall politically? Um, because I know what the party needs to do, but as far as reaching out, because when black women again, uh, we came through uh, this election cycle. I mean, like we came through hard, um, yeah. and, and it was very surprising for us because me and Sandra had this conversation, and we were really, I was a little bit kind of annoyed that black men were even considering Trump, much less vote for him. Um, but from listening to your perspective and Stephen's perspective, I kind of have a better idea and a sense of what that was. However, engaging these same black men um, to not to vote the way we vote, but just try to just just come out there and vote too, because not even we're not even talking about not just the general election. These down ballot candidates, the ones that make decisions on your everyday lives, yes, they ain't voting for those. They're not voting for that. Like so, where do we? How do we? You know, how do we get you all engaged to do that? Like you know, like the way we're doing. 
Yeah. Narnik, all I would say is, is to answer it really shortly. We, first off, I, I don't even think the black woman needs to go out their way to do that again. Because again, the black women have been holding black men up for so long. I think it's time for black men to take an initiative. But to answer your question, as a black community, I think we need to start, especially men, every man in the world, they need to talk about their mental health. They need to talk about their financial situation with their partners, their family, anybody who they can confide in. And they need to be comfortable with their sexuality. And I say this personally, just because the world is changing. The outlook on everything in the world is completely different from what it was 20, 50 years ago. We have to open our eyes to the reality of what's happening nowadays and realize that, I mean, the sun does not revolve around us, but unless we can address the issues, the internal conflicts and, the, and then address the external ones, there's no way around us finding a solution. You have to talk to yourself and then you can let that out personally. But I, and that's just my well, take because honestly, get good with you. You gotta get good with you. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask you. I'll ask you three ladies this right here. Uh, 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 you know, ultimately, how is the black man as identified? Because what we see, what I see, just from my brothers and and everything, is often we we are we are identified by three ways. By three ways, we we the thugs. We're athletes or we're businessmen. You know, like that's that's you know, those those are those are our only three categories. What a nerd. Yeah, what a nerd at. Where the nerds at though? Where the nerds at, man? And, and that's what I was gonna say. I would say that but, I, I think but, that's but, just but, the but that that speaks for what we gotta be able to we talk have to be <laughs> we but we have to be we have to be accepted. We're we're not we're we're not accepted, and, and that's how when they say the black community is not a monolith, the monolithic idea comes from the black male. That's mm -hmm. where it comes from because the black male kind of all is 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 summed up in just these small categories, and they're putting these though they're so, pigeonholed by these ideas. I need to so, the so, guys, who identifies the black man as a athlete, a thug, or a businessman? Who do you who do you I mean, that's, that's, that makes that's, that's general society. That general society. I mean, it, it's it's it, we're we're we are kind of classifying those three. Then we're we're not allowed to openly talk about anything other than those three those three subject matters. You know, even even Honestly. the black man. You know, uh, you know, like Stephen said, we're we're a black man isn't a lot. It doesn't do, isn't accepted when he speaks about other things. You know, and as I said, we're not being listened to. We're being heard, or we're not being listened to. You know, when we want to I talk about all around, this I must be hanging you. around a, a different group of black men because I'm I, I'm not I'm not hanging around with either one of those groups that you're referring to. And, and and like my husband doesn't fall into that category. And I listen and I listen to him. I exact I understand exactly what you're saying. Um I listen to him um uh intently to make sure that I'm meeting his needs. Um I, I I'm gonna say something that's gonna upset everybody on this panel, and I'm prepared for that. When you're talking about um, black men, you know, identifying with Trump, and I'm, I'm probably going to say it wrong, identifying with Trump because he he talks about money, you know, I, I understand that, and I know that Nikki made a you know made reference to the fact that she heard you and Stephen, and she understands you know how you all got there. We want to be able to support you out. We want to be able, black women want to be able to support that too, but this black woman, and I'm just speaking for me, and I'm married to a black man. We need y'all to be more like LeBron, and more like and, and, and more like. Um, you uh, tell, you dance, listen, girl, you 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 gotta find another example. We need y'all, LeBron, but he hurt our feelings, right? He treated us like a jump off. So, uh, nah, we, you need another we, example. Okay, my, we need we okay, need okay. you guys to marry. We need you guys yeah. when you get money yeah. to marry black women. We need you, we need you guys when you marry yeah, when you get money to bear, to marry black women. That's what we need. So if you, I mean, if if my, if you guys are gonna focus on money, you gotta put that money back into your back into your women instead of getting all and getting this money and then marrying, you know, Karen. We, we don't uh, know. Well, Gucci boots with the Gucci boots and a heated and a heated um leather <laughs> SUV seats. We don't want you marrying Karen. I think with the good hair. I I would have to say. I would have to say. I just. I, a, I tell you a funny story. I had I owned I, I at one point I was I owned a 2005 
a Ford F-150 and a 1989 Honda Accord. Now, I drove my Honda Accord on a regular basis, and that was my, that was my consistent car. You no, know, definitely better on gas and everything. And one day, me and, me and my homeboy, Jason, we go, we go to this spot. We hang out at the end. We, we park a lot pimping in the early 2000s at, at, in front of the club in my Honda Accord. And nobody looked at us. I went, I went back to the house and grabbed an F-150 and came back, and all of a sudden, everybody wanted to holler at us. You was at the you club. Know, you know what kind of women go to the club? I understand that. I, understand. This is, I, I, I do understand that. <laughs> you should have you should have went to the bookstore. It's you should have went, went, went to Trader oh, Joe's. I don't get you went to Barnes and Noble. I, I understand that, <laughs> I but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that at, at that I'm at that juncture time, it, and just to give you an idea how how just we are we are looked at <laughs> different by the fact that you know we we didn't say we didn't say anything different. We didn't speak anything different. We. You know, we were the same gentleman that we, hey, how you doing? And we didn't get looked at twice sitting on the hood of, uh, sitting when on the truck when, when, you when you're picking up club girls, that's what you get. You, when you're picking up girls to go to the flea market <laughs> to get an outfit and go to the club, that's what you need. That's what you're going to get. You need, you, right. you need, go to Barnes and Noble and your hoopty. Just, and, You'll be all right. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine now. <laughs> I, I would say, I, I think, I think that this is a more universal conversation for all yeah, men. Yeah, because we we kind of getting sidetracked, right? Yeah, I'm fine now, but wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, it's getting so, so we, we gotta wrap this up because we're at like an hour and a half right now, right? Wait, let me ask the last question. So um, can you guys tell me if y'all think Trump listens? Does Trump listen? Because one of the things Girl, that we, no. you know, you know, men need women. You know, Girl, men, you begging the question. Is Trump listening? Girl, you is begging the question. That's a different question. We, that, that was a quick one. <laughs> no, no, you, no, you got time question. for another question. Does Trump never listen? Is Trump listening to y'all? Is Trump listening? No. No, I can't answer no, that. I'm not that, a black man. I can answer that. No, go to the next question. We watched oh, two you. presidential, oh, like, we watched two presidential debates and this man did not listen to nobody. He, you, yeah, that was, a, that question was bad. No, no, she was asking if the black, if they listen, if he listen. Black people. So maybe there's something to that because they over there voting for him. So Andrew, what say you? Let me tell you, let me tell you, no, no Trump, agenda. no Trump was not listening. No Trump does not listen, did not listen to the black man at all and did not do anything in that nature. But what Trump did do was Trump was able to, to hear what the rhetoric is and throw out what he thought we wanted to, that, that we needed to hear or what we wanted. He threw that on the table quickly to try to, to, like I said, that was the bait that he threw in the water. And a lot of black men did bit the bait and they're fried up fish right now in the frying pan already. That's what it is. So it's it's one of those things where he he heard he heard the rhetoric and not listen to really what what was needed. The idea of okay, let's 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 go ahead and 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 put put the black man back in position by putting these programs back in the school that black men are more utilized or more comfortable with. You know, like I said, the, the things that most, mo a lot of black men are, are, are great with their hands. Me, myself, I'm, I'm not the guy that loves to, to fix on things, but I can fix anything in my house. Not that I want to do it, but it's something that I can do. If I had the option, I could go out there and be a plumber. I'd go out there and be a, a, a carpenter. You know, because we are we are mechanically inclined, and we have that that's something that we can do. Any black man out there? What Trump didn't hear is what Trump didn't hear about not listening is okay. Well, if I just throw some money at the black man, he's gonna be all right. He's gonna come instead mm -hmm. of actually inflicting or, or or putting things in place for us to be able to be self sufficient. Because that's ultimately what the black man has been saying through this through through for both parties. For both parties, because the Democratic Party ultimately gained, they gained the black woman by throwing money at the black woman in the 60s. And that's how they gained the black woman. That's for the next show. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to invite you back. That's gonna that's for the next show. So so we're gonna wrap up right now. 
right? Um, so we're going to make our final thoughts, final comments. What I'm going to say is that what we need to do right now is figure out what our ask is, right? And I'm not, and I got that from the ASK. We got to figure out what our ask is. And I heard that from one of the um, strategists for the um, um, Biden campaign. So I'm not going to take credit for, for those words, right? So now, you know, um, Biden has said he wants to do all of these things if he wins. Tr Trump claims that he will, but we need to know what it is exactly we want, right? And, and people of color need to to decide what it is that they want and what their expectations are and they need to come up with a plan on how to get it and how to, how to ask for it and how to get it right so to uh, final thoughts for the two brothers on the panel i need y'all to tell us what it is that black men want from politics like what do you want from what do you want these elected officials what do you want to get from them what are your expectations from them what what is it what y'all want <laughs> what y'all want <laughs> I'm gonna let Mr. Forbes go first because that question is very hard to answer. Okay, well, I, I'll tell you my 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 expect my expectations are 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 zero, quite honestly. From, he said from zero. <laughs> yes, from from both both presidential candidates, my expectations are zero for for them to do anything. And I always say, you know, if you don't you don't have any expectations, you can't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So my expectations are zero from from both of them. What my ask is. What my ask is, is I ask, I'm asking for them to put programs in that, that are, that highlight the abilities of the black man from a black male standpoint. Like I said, those programs that we are, that we are comfortable in doing at this time, because uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, until the mindset of the community changes, we are not That's comfortable in doing the community. educational things the scholarships yeah, and all yeah, that yeah, stuff, yeah, but we are comfortable uh, yes, I in do doing the, the, the labor intensive things. We are comfortable. We a, a man has no problem with saying, hey, I built this house before you can say, he will rather say I built this house than before you'll say I designed this house at this point in time. And we have to change, we have to fix that mindset, but that's gonna take a little bit longer. So we have to put programs in that makes them feel comfortable with, that makes them be able to use that put them in that comfort zone to be sufficient, to be able to say, okay, this is a job that I can do. It's not, you know, to, to now reinvigorate that confidence, you know, and now that confidence passes down from, from, from that black man to his son. And that's where, that's where it's missing. Me, my, my son is, my sons are, the, are, 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 are super confident. They, they can run up a wall right now. But that's because I'm I instill that confidence in them because I have the confidence in myself. And so that's that's where that's what happens. And too many black men don't instill the confidence in their children because they don't have the confidence in themselves that they could apply or do other things. So if we have those successful and put those programs in place, like I say, you know, bring back bring back auto mechanics, bring back shop class, bring back those things. You know, even if even if you're not going to put it in the school. You know, put it in in, a, in an area that these young men can now go in or make it affordable, because now to get an ASC certified, you you're paying for college. You know, you're you're putting yourself in debt, and now you're you know you're 50 years old before you start making money anyway. If you start at 25, because you're taking out a forty thousand dollar loan, fifty thousand dollar loan to get ASC certified. You know, to get your carpentry license, to get your your plumbing license. Unfortunately. So if we can bring in those programs that, that's, that will now, okay, a man can make money on his own and that instills that confidence in success and the success comes in those small steps. Once he's more confident, then it starts to create a, 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 different, a different path. So I would, I would hope and my ask is to put programs in place to, to, that can create success. We cannot make somebody successful, but we could put a program that could create a successful mind frame, and those small wins are, are going to create that successful mind frame. And now you're willing, now you're more willing to try something else because you've at least taken care of that basic necessity of how I'm going to feed myself. All right, so he's like create an opportunity. Yeah, right. Just we want them to develop put in programs that's going to create the opportunities. And it's, at that point, now it's like um, self-will. It's up to you, um, those individuals, or whether or not they're going to make the best of those opportunities. All right. right. Meza. 
What's gonna be your ask, black man? <laughs> <sighs> I guess I guess my ask would have to be simply like <sighs> this is so hard to answer because there's so many asks. But if I had to really narrow it down, just just listen for once. Like I know that there are tons of people of color and black men and black women and black kids, but there is not one spokesperson for the black community. And I think that is the biggest issue nowadays. We rely on one opinion and there's so many different views. We have rich black people, people who are impoverished, people who are trying to make it and people who are looking for opportunities to move themselves up into a higher place. So I guess my ask would be to be open-minded, be creative, be ingenuitive, find a way to really bridge the divide between black America and every piece of America. I mean, th there's nothing more I can ask for. There's such a disconnect between the community that th there's a reason why we're so distant and so separated and we're looking for every means to find the answers we're looking for as to why there are Black Americans voting for Trump. People are looking for a solution. And all I'm asking is our politicians, Joe Biden as our next president and every other elected official to just look at what's going on through an open lens because there's so much going on in the world that I just, I feel like there's really no true real answer. And Mr. Forbes gave so many great solutions. Yes, we need opportunity. Yes, I believe we need to have way more options because that's the only way we can really truly be a liberal democratic society. But I would have to say that we have to continue to think on an, in an abstractive approach to this because we're gonna continue to evolve. We're continuing to build as a society and as a community. And, and we need so much more than what we can say within these last few uh, minutes of our statement. And all I can say is again, look at what's truly happening in the America today to find real answers for tomorrow. We cannot move America forward unless we truly look through the lens and step in the shoes of the people we're hoping to represent and advocate for. So my ask at the end of the day is keep an open mind, think outside the box and continue to move America forward in a way that is equitable and, and, and justifiable. We need rationality more than ever. We need ethics and morality. We need every bit of what makes our country great to be great for everybody. And if we lack any of those common principles of the American dream, we're, we're, we're creating a disservice again to every piece of every person of this nation. And, and we just need, we, we need hope. Uh, and Barack Obama gave us that. And I know that that seems far gone, but it's possible. And every day we look for it. The, and I just hope that everybody can continue to look for it because there's really no simple answer to this question. And that's why I can't give something so specific. My answer may be ambiguous, but it's simple in the sense that I'm looking for you to put in the effort to really show that you care enough to find the solutions to the problems that happen to us and everyday Americans, because our reality is the reality of many other people. I mean, I don't wanna say this is a, a particular situation. It's possibly a universal conversation that's happening every day and we have to accept that truth or else we're gonna be in denial of the facts of what's happening every day. Um, if, I, if I may add one more thing, thank you, Stephen. Good, uh, it, it wasn't ambiguous to me, I, I understand it clearly. But um, I will say one, one more thing that I will ask is uh, in, in current 2020, the foundation of America has been, has been shaken uh, greatly, the foundation. And what I do know is America, the ones that set the foundation are black. Black set the foundation and created the foundation of America. And my ask is if they're the ones that built the foundation, you probably need to go back to them to figure out how to repair the foundation. Because that's ultimately where it comes from. Blacks built, blacks, this is what America was built on. And as long as as long as we are being uh, still let in the side door, the foundation will continue to be shaken. It's going to get worse and worse until it falls apart. We need to go back to the masters um, of the so, foundation. Yep. yep. Uh, I so for me, uh, just to wrap up because we're going to wrap up now. And thank you, Steve.
Thank you, Andrew. It was great. And um, I learned a few things, um, getting some perspectives that I, you know, was missed on me. And now I can kind of connect the dots. Doesn't mean that I agree totally, but it does mean that I'm able to see things in a different way and have a very good conversation moving forward. I love my black men. I'm not going to throw them out. I'm not going to dish them. I'm not going to do none of that because they mine. And what I will do though, moving forward and always is make sure that I have a good conversation with my black men. And I love the fact that we were able to have this conversation. And even though we may not agree on everything, but one thing we do agree upon is that uh, the conversation has to happen and the conversation needs to be done in a, in, 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 with constructive criticism. And when I say constructive criticism is important that we, we call out our faults because as a people, as a community, um, we have to kind of start unifying. We're not unified, we're very fragmented. And like you said, we're not a monolithic. We, we, we have different wants and needs, and, but there's a, a common goal that we share is our race. And our race is our power. Our race is what brings us together. Our race is what, is what gets us to have this connection. And I don't wanna lose that. Um, so when it was concerning for us to see that black men were voting for Trump, um, I really wanted to understand why. It was very important for me to understand why. So, so we can have this conversation. I don't wanna be like those people on Facebook bashing black men and y'all ain't shit, excuse, excuse my language or whatever. That's not true. I know that there's reasons why you all do what you do. And it's important that we have this platform to have that kind of conversation. I wanna thank everybody for coming on especially our two men. Um, I know this is a, you know, we, it's a short time and we have to try to get it all in, but it's kind of hard for us. It really should only be an hour show, but we've gone over again. Always, um, right? But As always, 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 always. So I want to thank um, Sandra and Carol. Let Carol say her, like her, her, her final thoughts. And I just got like two sentences. I'm going to say after that, go ahead. I just I want to I want to thank um, Andrew and Stephen for being on tonight. Um, I, I really did appreciate the conversation, and um, I agreed more than I disagreed. Um, I agreed more than I disagreed. I, I believe that you know I, I I am I have I have nothing but love for black for black men. I, I come from a long line of black men. My father was a black man and he was a very good man and my husband is a black man and he is a very good man um i, I think i think um what andrew said is 100 percent correct that we need to learn to listen um to black men and it's unfortunate that the only person that they found to listen to them in the last hundred years is a bigot and so we got to do better you know um we we got to do better so I, I really did appreciate the conversation and always, I always learn um, so much from Steven. I do want to say this, that my friend Drew was in my watch party and he uh, reiterated something that, that Steven said, when Steven said political, when he was, when Steven was referring to Abraham Lincoln, Steven said political motives are not moral imperatives. And Drew repeated that and then he thanked Steven for, um, for, for saying that. So thank you guys um, for being on tonight. We really did appreciate. I, I really did appreciate it. So my th final thought was is that we ended up having almost like a relationship conversation um, today, right? But we needed to understand that relationship. We needed to speak about those relationships to understand the politics of it all, right? So even though it seemed like we were going down a rabbit hole, but because we understand the relationship that we have with black men and the relationship that black men are having with politics. It's, it made us understand that situation um, a lot better. Cause I really was like, but how the heck, you know, and I get it, right? Like, you know, you're seeking that attention and sometimes even if it's negative, you, you want it, right? So we, as, as we, as black women who are like the super voters out there, right? as we understand that the type of relationship that we need to have with our brothers, our fathers, our friends, our uncles, all of the, these bins in our lives, we, the politics of it all is, is, is definitely gonna get better. And thank you all for like coming tonight. Um, you know, we always try to make it an hour, but we be hitting almost two every time. But I think it was very good conversation. It was a very needed conversation. We had a lot of good comments. 
Um, I think this is probably like the most comments I've gotten besides, you know, um, about this and they were all productive and, uh, and people are here for it. And we really appreciate the conversation. And thank you, Andrew, for like both Andrew and Steven. Like, I think I called them like yesterday, like today and the day before. And they was like, yep, I'm here. I'm here to do it. And I, I will make myself available. So thank you very much for coming, sharing your time with us and to the people and, and putting that information out there. Cause we really did need to, we did, I need to know this and hopefully Joe Biden will win Nevada right and um you know we'll at least have somebody um that not only going to listen because one of the things I always talk about is like yes conversations are important but I don't want to have a conversation with anybody that's not ready to put in some work once when, when, once we have that conversation right so at least I would say that um Joe Biden is he's good we can have a conversation with him but he's also ready to put in that work and and that's one of the more re main reasons I would prefer that he is our uh, president than the one that we already have. All right. I'll be remiss to say uh, Elijah, Elijah Manley says, Stephen, you looking good and you sounding good. Just want to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, ladies. Thank no, you, thank I, you. I enjoyed it. Bye, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, anytime. All right. Anytime. Good night. All right. Good night. All right. Good night, everyone.